So hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about how to enable Android to AOT on your own mobile device. I'm Matthijs Korpenzoek. I'm Dutch. I live in Toulouse, France, the Gulf. I'm an embedded Android Linux engineer at Believe, who is, if you don't know, a small consulting company who does who has around 60 engineers in the world. We contribute to uh, open source projects like Linux, Reboot, Android, Docto, Zephyr. I'm also a UB custodian, so I'm, I maintain some, some small subsystems in Reboot, like UBDFU, USB gadget, Fastboot, and some Android commands. So today we'll start with a small introduction, then we'll talk about getting started with Android or recovering the build system, uh, then we'll speak about the Android common kernel and the changes we need to do for our board. After that, we'll look into bootloaders, and finally, we'll be booting Android to home screen. So, I hope there will be some time for questions at the end. If there's not, please come see me, talk to me, I'll be there all week. Okay, so let's start. So, why would we want to import Android in the first place? So, the first reason that comes to mind is to use your computer as a heater in cold winters. I uh, think it's very appropriate here since it's quite cold in, uh, in, in here. I don't know for you, but for me, the winds was killing me this morning. Uh, so, jokes aside, Android is a very feature rich operating system. It has a lot of batteries included, like multimedia support, camera, nice screen, and animations. It also has a good system update support, which is shared with Chrome OS. So, overall, a lot of batteries included. Also, Android is a very well known developer API. So, when you're making apps or um, custom user experience, you could make a product with Android in there. Finally, we could just port Android for learning purposes. So, when porting Android, we're mostly interested by the lower layers on, the, on this guy, diagram. So, the hardware abstraction layers, the native themes and libraries, and the Linux kernel. All the rest just comes from with Android, and usually you don't have to modify it. So, let's have a look at the development board we'll be using to illustrate this presentation. So, the board we'll be looking at is the Beagle Play from BeagleBoard.org. It's uh, it has a TI SoC in there, AM62X. It has a quad-core A53 Cortex from ARM. It has 2 GB of RAM, 16 GB of flash, HDMI for, for display out, USB-C for powering and for debugging, and also has a UART debugger available. So the plan. We download the sources, we load the kernel from the bootloader, we boot to console, we boot to AV devices, we boot to boot on immersion, and finally we boot to home screen. Ready? Let's go. Before, small warning, I will be presenting source code, so if you're allergic, well, maybe you should go or close your eyes. I, I like to do this because for me it's a good way of illustrating the changes we need to do. So, let's start. Getting started with Android. So, the Android source code is available on source.android.com, which is also the official documentation. It has a lot of resources there, so I would recommend going and have a look there. Uh, today we'll be covering Android Open Source Project, also named AOSP. This is a bit different than what's on your phones, because on your phones you usually have proprietary stuff as well. Like for example, GNS Google Mobile Services. So Android has a lot of branches which are public. The main developer branch is called main. Today we'll be covering Android 14 R60. I know 15 is out, but not enough time to update my slides. So, but I think the things we'll cover today will also be appropriate for Android 15. So, let's get to sources. To do so, we use repo, which is a, wrapper, a Python wrapper around Git, and after downloading everything with repo init and repo sync, we have around 1,300 Git projects, we have around 200 GB of source code, and we need a quite powerful machine in order, in order to build. For example, 64 GB of RAM is recommended. I have uh, 24 CPUs on my computer to build, and you can see that on my setup, it took around 40 minutes to download the sources. Let's have a look at the sources we just downloaded. So, quite some folders there. Uh, the most interesting ones to us is device for board support, hardware for all the hardware abstraction layers, external for some upstream projects that are imported into AOSP, and sometimes we'll look at system to look at the system services like init or the lock, lock server and things like that. Okay, let's try to build. So, we source an environment setup file, we type launch to pick our build target, and we have a warning, which is strange. Uh, 
guys. So that, that doesn't look right. Let's have a look at, at the logs to get some more clues. So it tells us to type in some very long, complicated string, AOSP, CF, X86, blah, blah, blah. So when we do that, uh, we still have an error. It says, oh, it's this, this is not the right release. You have to type AP2A. So when we do this, we can see that no more errors. The build system seems happy. So, OK. But what is CF? CF stands for Cuttlefish, uh, which is a virtual Android device. It's an excellent reference code. Uh, I recommend have a look at it. We will keep going back to Cuttlefish during this presentation to get inspiration. So it's also maintained by Google, and they use it for real-world testing, like they run CTS and VTS on Cuttlefish. So if we look at if we look up this string, we find that there's an Android products file in device Google Cuttlefish. So let's see if we can do the same for our Beagle Play. So we create a folder, device Beagle, Beagle Play. We go in there, we create two files, Android product.mk and product.mk. We put some make file magic in there and we can launch. Okay, it's recognized, but not entirely. Apparently we miss some variables or something. So if we define the board architecture, uh, the CPU variants and some product variables like the manufacturer and other things, we can launch and we can make. Great, we managed to build, no errors anymore. And it only took 13 minutes, that's quite fast, right? Hmm, let's have a look at the build output. So if we look at the build output, we can see that there's only one image here, the RAM desktop image. That's, that's odd, that shouldn't be the case because Android has a lot of partitions. If you look at this link here, you'll see that there are quite some other images we expect. For example, the boot image or the vendor boot image or the system image. So let's have a look at a typical partitioning scheme we would be expecting. So here is one possible partitioning scheme for modern Android. Uh, there's a missed partition to communicate between the bootloader and um, the Android system. There's boot A and B for the kernel and the generic RAM disk. Vendor boot for the vendor specific things. There's super with dynamic partitions. And then there's metadata and user data for user files. So what is AB? So AB basically is, uh, you have two sets of partitions, boot A and boot B. Uh, it allows to have two, two systems uh, running at this or on the, on the same device. When you update from A to B and you cannot boot your B, then you can roll back to A. So it's a safety mechanism. And um, the dynamic partitions basically is user space partitions. So you, on GPT, you have one partition named super and you can fit a lot of, lot of partitions in there. These are also called logical partitions. So let's have a look how we inform the Android build system about these partitions. So we add some variables in the board config. For example, what's our size of the boot image? Here we take 64 megabytes. Uh, what's the file system for user data? And uh, well, I, everything didn't fit on the slide, but at the end of this presentation, there's a link to a Git project where you can have the full source to see what other changes are needed to inform about this. Okay, let's rebuild. Ah, other error. Kernel, what's that? Ah yeah, maybe we'll need that to talk to a hardware. Uh, so um, let's see how that works. Where can we download this? Isn't it part of Android? Okay, let's talk about the Android common kernel. So Android common kernel is a downstream of the kernel.org kernel. It has some Android specific patches in there. Uh, for each Android release, there are some version requirements on the Android kernel. For example, for Android 14, we can have 6.1 or 5.15. The Android kernel is also fetched via repo, the same tool we use to fetch the Android source code. However, it's in a different source tree or different folder. Uh, there's a concept we need to look into, which is the generic kernel image, which we'll cover in the next slide. And for this time, we'll take the most recent one because I like modern code base. So let's use 6.1. So generic kernel image is an effort done by Google uh, for quite some years now. Uh, basically, before they started this, every phone, every device had its own kernel with lots of out of three patches and it was impossible to update. So they, to just to, it's a very uh, shortcut, but 
just the takeaway of this is that they push for now having one single image, one single binary that run on all the phones. Of course, depending on your architecture. So this means that as a vendor or as a device implementer, we must have everything to work as modules. That's just to take away. If you're more interested, there are a lot of links in the slides. Usually they point to the official documentation. Uh, it's much more in depth on there, but I have to go fast because there's quite some things to cover. Um, so let's go back to see how we can add Beagle Play support in the Android kernel. Well, the problem is that Beagle Play landed in 64 and we have 6.1, so we have to backport and that's never fun. Um, fortunately, TI has a public uh, kernel tree for 6.1 with Beagle Play support, so we can just backport the patches from there. We can backport the device tree, all the drivers we need, like UART, Clock, Spy, and so on. And after 1,700 patches, we should have everything. That's quite a lot, I know. Uh, it's because the TI tree has multiple SOCs supported in there, and it was much easier to port everything than to handle all the conflicts. So that's why this much, this much patches. Um, also, a side note, Android has uh, some specific porting rules for patches, so they, they advise you to prefix your commit with upstream, backport from Git, and so on. And it's, frankly, I think it's quite useful to, to track where your patches come from. For example, if your patch comes from the mailing list and hasn't been merged, you prefix with from list. Okay, so we have ported everything. Now let's see how we build the Android kernel. So it's not the standard build system we're used to with Make. Uh, they have something else called Kleef, uh, which is ba based on Bazel. Uh, so it's quite well documented, but it's something new to learn again. Um, so we, the first thing we want to do is to enable our architecture. So the, um, for AM62, the architecture is named K3. So we have to enable that. And we have to put all these kernel configurations into a dev config fragment. So to go a bit in more details, these are the changes. I hope you can see it, it's maybe a bit small. This is, these are the changes that are needed to uh, build our Beagle Play kernel. So on the top here, we have the list of modules we would need. Right now there's only one because there are plenty and it wouldn't fit on the slides. I put the UART driver because I like logs. Uh, and then some other important things are the outputs. Here we want the image and we want the device tree binary. And also there's the build config, which is the dev config fragment we're using. So again, I want to insist on this. Make sure that your drivers work as modules, otherwise it will just break miserably. So, so now that we've built, let's have a look at how we can put this back into the Android build system. So we create a new folder uh, named device beagle beagle play kernel. In there we put a subfolder 6.1 and we just copy all our binaries there. So the, the, the kernel image uh, and uh, the modules. Then we have to um, add some other logic in the board config to say, hey, here's my kernel image, and these are the, the modules I need to have in my RAM disk, so very early on when booting. Let's see how we inform the Android build system about uh, DTB inclusion now. So there's some logic for there handed by the build system. You just give a folder and the build system will collect all the device tree binaries and append them at the end of the vendor boot partition, even if it says include in boot image here. Okay, so now let's go back and build our boot image and our vendor boot image. Well, that seems to work, that's great. The file command seems to recognize the boot image as being an Android boot image. However, there's some strange warning about trouble and unsafe. And I don't know if you're about you, but I don't like unsafe very, very much. So let's have a look what the treble thing means. So treble is a quite older initiative right now. I think it's from Android 8. Uh, basically, it's a clean separation between the Android OS, which is developed by Google, and the vendor implementation, which is developed by people like me or, or SOC uh, vendors. And, so before that, it was impossible to update your Android OS without reworking the vendor stuff. And with this clean separation, it's now possible to update your Android OS without having to change vendor, vendor specific code. So it has been there for quite some time now. So it's a bit strange that we get this warning when building. 
so this is because we forgot to set a very important variable, which is called product shipping API level. Uh, so this, this tells the build system on which Android version your product shipped. So in our case, we're just starting, we'll be shipping on 14, uh, so we use shipping API level 34. I don't really understand the relationship between the numbers, but it's documented, so let's just set it to 34. Okay, when we do this, the warning goes away, that's great. Uh, let's have a look at our run this content now. So, it seems a bit empty. Uh, there's just some folders there and a build, a build property file. That's a bit strange. I would expect to see at least, at least the init binary. So keep in mind that Android has its own init language. It's not systemd, it's something completely different. Uh, so, but Android should provide core packages like init and other things. So maybe we're missing something. Let's have a look again at Cuttlefish. And if we dig through there, we can see that there are some make logic called product packages and something else called inherit product. So let's experiment with that a bit. If we display the product packages variable, we can see that for our build, it's empty. However, after inheriting from fullbase.mk, we get more than 700 packages. That seems a bit better. I mean, Android should provide us with core packages, right? We don't want to rewrite everything ourselves. So this time in the run disk, we have an init. That's great. Okay, I think it's time to try to boot our images. How do we boot? With a bootloader, of course. Uh, so for AM62, the, this is the boot flow. Uh, I won't cover it into details. Brian from TI made a presentation about this, I think two years ago. For our case, we're mostly interested in the red box where there's U-boot, which will be booting Linux, or in our case, the Android kernel. So let's look at, at U-boot in a bit more detail. So Android has no version requirements on the bootloader version. However, it has bootloader requirements, which has to be implemented. Right now, each vendor has its own specific implementation. And fortunately for us, U-boot implements most of the Android requirements, so we can just take a recent U-boot version, in my case it was 2024.10 20, RC3, and uh, since BeaglePlay is very well documented up upstream, we can just follow the other documentation to rebuild the bootloaders. And for booting Android, we can use uh, standard boot in U-boot and use the Android boot method. So let's see how we do that. We enable some dev config options, like uh, the fast boot function for USB, so that we can reflash for eMMC. Uh, we enable the boot method Android, we add our partitions to the board environment file, and we change the boot medium to be eMMC because we want to boot from eMMC. So my colleague, Guillaume Larocque, who should have been here, uh, but he's not because of the weather, uh, has, sub has upstreamed this, and uh, you can have a look at the link if you, you want to see more details. So speaking of eMMC, let's have a look at how the layout will be. So we have in boot zero, we have our first uh, a bootloader, and then in the user-defined area where all the other partitions are, we have a bootloader partitions with uh, TISPL and uboot.image. All this we can flash on our eMMC via the fastboot command. There's a backup slide deta detailing that. And okay, we flashed. Let's see how we can use the bootflow commands. So with bootflow scan, we can scan for uh, boot mediums for bootflows. We see that here we have the Android bootflow. It's considered ready, so that looks good. Uh, it also detects that it's on the eMMC, so let's select it and boot it. Well, it doesn't work, unfortunately. Another problem. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, well, we need to inform uh, the Android build system and especially how we build the boot image about some addresses. For example, the kernel offset. Where's the RAM disk? and um, what's, what's our page, page size, because that's now, that's now supported to have different ones on the newer versions of Android. Um, so we have to specify this, again, in our port config, and we also have to give some parameters to the kernel command line. For example, where's init? Uh, what's our console? Um, and also, an important one here is uh, printk death k message. So by default, um, Kernel logs are rate limited, but init is very verbose. 
And I like to see all my logs when stuff is going wrong, so I use this almost everywhere for bring up. So let's see how it goes when we, uh, when we add this. Yay, we can boot. Okay, only 45 slides just to arrive to this. <laughs> but uh, if we look a bit closer, we can see that after five seconds, it reboots. So, but at least, we, you know, we have our bootloaders that can boot our kernel and it starts and everything seems fine. It's even recognized the board model and everything, so great. Let's see how we go from here. So the error we were seeing was first stage mount not available. Uh, so this means that we need to create an fstab file which lists the partitions we want to mount. Uh, otherwise, we don't know how to go from there. So in order to do so, let's create a file with, with, where we list the virtual, the logical partitions and the physical partitions. And uh, let's add it to our RAM disk. We also have to set the Android boot dot hardware uh, variable in order for init to find the fstab file. So if you don't, init doesn't know that it needs to use the Beagle Play as a suffix. So, so let's let's try to build the other images because for now we've only built boot image and vendor boot image, which are like the early ones. But we also want the super image we talked about previously, right? So when we do that, yet another error. Yay! Okay, uh, what does it mean this time? What is device manifest? Uh, so, basically, device manifest is a list of all the hardware abstraction layers you have implemented as a, as a device. Uh, so, it's, it's for the build system to know what features are exposed and for the system as well. Uh, but we don't have anything about that right now. We don't want to do that for now. We just want to continue to build. So, let's add an empty one. And after an empty one and reflashing, success we managed to mount uh, the system uh, partition. So in, that, in this case, first stage mount is done. So that's great. Uh, let's have a look at second stage mounts, which would mean mounting user data. And in order to do so, we'll stop looking at the console because for now, there's another log buffer that's much more relevant for us, which is called logcat. So in our console, we can just look at it uh, by typing logcat here. I disabled the kernel messages with the message N1 just to not have everything mixed together. So if we look at logcat, we see this. Keystore 2, what is that? Uh, so Keystore is the service that's responsible for encryption and authentication on Android. It's uh, mandatory. Uh, I mean, imagine your phone, your user data is not encrypted on there. Imagine, I don't know, your messages or other things, you want it to be encrypted. So um, encryption is mandatory. So in order to support it as a vendor or a hardware implementer like, like ourselves, we have to write some hardware abstraction layers, key mint or key master and gatekeeper. <laughs> so I don't have any crypto knowledge and I don't want to do that. So fortunately, Android has uh, an insecure legacy software implementation we can use. So let's see how we add that to our vendor image. So we have to add some product packages, which are, which is, are the two HALs here. Uh, we have to tell in our device manifest, hey, this is the interface we're implementing. And we also have to give our processes some SC Linux uh, context. So this is, this is needed even if you're in permissive SC Linux, because init needs to know to who it's uh, giving the context after starting the process. So we've added Keymaster and Gatekeeper. Let's, let's have a look at what is needed to finish to decrypt user data. So we also need to support um, file metadata encryption. This is mandatory from Android 11 onwards. Uh, fortunately, this is well documented on the Android website. So we have to create an init RC file, which will be read by init, which basically triggers some actions based on on some events. For example, event named early FS starts the daemon named Voldy. Uh, so with this, second stage mount is done, which is great. And uh, we can see in the logs that user data has been mounted. So that's pretty good already. Uh, let's see now how we can enable another very useful tool for debugging Android, which is named ADB. 
So ADB and with debug bridge, it's used for USB debugging. Uh, it's, it allows you to view logcat. It allows you to pull some files from the system, to push some files on there. It's very useful. Um, the easiest way to enable ADB is to use configFS, uh, which is uh, the, the standard kernel way to configure your USB gadgets. Uh, this is deprecated now on Android, but it still works. Uh, so Cuttlefish doesn't use configFS. However, the Dragonboard, which is another nice reference device, uh, still has this. So we can just take inspiration from them. So we copy their file, we rename it to the Beagle Play, we change the USB vendor ID so that it's, it matches Texas Instruments and not Qualcomm. And with that, we have ADB devices that works. Now, let's have a look at graphics, uh, because of course we need to you know, do some rendering, otherwise we'll, we'll never see anything on the screen. Uh, so, usually it's your uh, graphic chip vendor that provides you with a uh, solution for this. However, I don't have access to that, so I'll be using what's public, and what's public, there's a rendering engine on CPU, which is called Swift Shader, uh, which is used by both Cuttlefish and Dragonboard. So, it will be very slow, but it will run. And for now, we just want to boot something. So it's very easy to enable this because uh, the guys from Lenaro made a device file we can just inherit from. So just with this line, we have everything we need for Swift Shader. Now let's look at display. Display is another topic. Uh, there is mainly the graphics allocator, mapper, and composer that we need to implement, so other house. Uh, so in, in AOSP, there's a component called MiniGBM, which implements allocator and mapper. Fortunately, it's not compatible with the TI display subsystem, which is what is used on the Beagle Play. Uh, so again, I want to just go as far as I can. So I'll use a virtual graphics card, uh, which is a kernel module called VKMS. So with that, we have another graphic card, card, card one, and we can allocate buffers. And then for the composer part, there's an upstream project named uh, GRM Hardware Composer, uh, which is generic and works really well. So now that we have graphics and display, what's missing? Well, apparently we need audio as well, otherwise we can boot. So uh, uh, fortunately there is another reference device called Yukawa, which is the Vim3 from, uh, from Kadas. Uh, so they have an audio HAL, so we can just use that one. And for power and health, there are examples provided by OSP. So we, we just add those to our product packages. We add, of course, the interfaces in the device manifest XML we talked about earlier. We add some SLN context, and hopefully we're almost done. Let's just disable uh, suspend and resume first, uh, because with all this stuff going on this, on the CPU, it might be a bit unstable if we try to suspend. So, Let's just talk to the power manager over ADB and say, hey, you know what? We just want to stay on for now. And with that, yay, the home screen, finally. Okay, that only took 58 slides to get here, right? Uh, so this is done with a tool called Screen Copy, which basically gets the screen over USB. So it's horribly slow. We have, um, I don't know, maybe half an image uh, per second or so. It's, it's very, very slow, but you know, we, we got there, so great. Uh, so to sum up, we needed to boot Android, we needed to write an FSTAP file, to implement Keymaster and Gatekeeper, to support encryption via user data and metadata, uh, to enable ADB for better debugging over USB, to have graphics uh, enabled via Swift Shader, to support the display via mini GBM and DRM hardware composer. And also we needed to add it audio power and health. With that, we have something that boots. Barely, but it boots. Uh, so what's next? As I was saying, this thing is very, very slow. It's, it's not for you know, production. Uh, there would be plenty of other things to do, uh, like for example, uh, enabling SE Linux as enforcing, which is quite some time consuming, or enabling graphics on the GPU using Mesa, for example, or, you know, vendor lips. Uh, enabling, properly enabling display support, or enabling Keymaster and Gatekeeper via a secure element like Opti or via Trusty, for example. Enabling connectivity, enabling re recovery OS, enabling camera. There are a lot of things to do uh, on Android. 
this is just barely scratching the surface of what's needed to use your board. So as I was saying, the links are, the link is available here. Uh, if you want to have a look, it should be a bit documented, but this is of course just example code. If you want something that works a bit better, uh, you can use the, the TI SDK, which you know has graphic acceleration and everything, so it's much faster than this. Well, with that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Thank you for the demonstration. How is the boundary between saying couple of bytes uh, is for which version is it for which game? Is that the slide is a different version or much different if you're looking at a different vendor on the board? Is it like that or is it not like that? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like uh, if I use an earlier version of Android, for example? Uh, so I think audio has been a requirement for at least a couple of versions. I don't know for 15. Uh, Keymaster and, and Gatekeeper are definitely needed for 15 as well. Um, the, the earlier you go, uh, the less uh, separation there is between uh, system and vendor code, so it's a bit more mixed. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... And you can, of course, come and see me after the talk as well if you want to talk uh, later on. No, I have not, and I really want to try, actually, because I'm quite excited about uh, PowerVR being mainline. I don't know, I don't know how, what the status is on Linux. Usually, we're a bit behind uh, a regular Linux distribution, so... I uh, know I haven't tried. I, I, I won't. Sorry? Yes, yes. So imagination provides uh, code, which I will not talk about because I'm not allowed to or I don't like it. But, uh, they, so they provide code that enables the GPU and it, it works. Ah, yeah. So yeah, what I've talked about is mostly um, the, like how to make it work on hardware. If you want to have the Play Store and everything else, then there is a lot of more work than, than just this. Uh, as you were saying, you need to pass certifications like Android CTS and VTS, which are the compliance tests. Uh, there are, there's over a million tests uh, to be run there. Uh, so we do run that uh, on some uh, TI boards. It takes 30 to 40 hours to run, and we just run the, the public uh, tests because I think there's also some more which are only for like certification for partners or stuff, and I don't have any access to that, so I, I can't talk about that very much. Uh, two at the same time. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I don't know. I don't know. I just make the code. I don't know what people do with it. So uh, <laughs> I must say that even with a GPU acceleration and everything, it's not super fast because it's, it's, the CPU is, is not very powerful and 2 GB of RAM for Android, it's a bit low. But it works, so go ahead. It has, it has requirements on the bootloader, it just doesn't have any version requirements on the bootloader you use. I see, so you weren't able to, you had to replace the original bootloader that previously came with it. You had to replace it with something else to make it work faster? Uh, yes, well, I, I had a, a board with nothing on there, 
And uh, if you take, if you, or if you take what Beagle provides you, they give you a Linux distribution, and that bootloader doesn't have support for booting Androids because it's not, uh, it's not a fit image or something standard you would know. It's something called the Android boot image, which is different file format. So you must have support in your bootloader for parsing that, know where the RAM disk is, uh, how to get the DTB, and other things like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. How is the workflow when I want to keep track with Android before the update? Do I do a blood test to run this boot after two weeks and then reboot everything, or is there some, some shortcut or some, some other way to find workflow? How do so, it's, it's secure, but I don't want to have any issues? Yeah, so it depends how you, it depends what, what your baseline is. Uh, so what, what I usually do is I stick to um, a main Android re release, in this example, Android 14. Uh, each month or two months, there is a minor update on 14. So this time we were covering R60, and it will, there will be R62, R63 at some point. So what I do is I just update my manifest uh, to point to these new projects, and usually it just gives you like security fixes and stuff. Yeah. So that I don't break everything up. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, we, I mean, in my experience, updating just the minor uh, releases, like from R60 to R62 or something, it did, we didn't have that much breakage. We did have last, so when they migrated to the trunk stable development, we did have some, some regressions at that point. Uh, but usually it doesn't happen that much. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know that much about it. I will do the research. Uh. <laughs> yes? Like, how, what, what would be needed to use a regular mainline and not the Android mainline kernel? Yep. I have no idea. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I think there, there are maybe less than 500 patches now. I don't, I don't know, uh, actually. But, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but so to, to continue on that, uh, so Android has a branch which they call Android mainline, which tracks mainline, and it's... Uh, each time there's a new RC, it's merged back into the mainline, so it's, it's quite close to mainline. Of course, it's out of three, but it's not as terrible as it used to be like five or ten years ago. It's much better now. Sorry? Yeah. Well, I think time is up anyway, so uh, thank you.